Many people wonder why so many Christians are hypocritical and judgmental. Now, you may be one of them. So it causes me to ask, what is the real thing when it comes to following Christ? I mean, we all want the real thing. Millennials particularly are looking for the real thing. Millennials, those born from 1980 to 2000, uh, many writers have, have written about them that they, you know, they are leaving the church in droves. Uh, they call them self-absorbed and godless and um, leaving the faith of their fathers. I mean, it's true that only 15% of millennials in the United States are Christians. But are they more godless than previous generations? I mean, years past, most people attended church in our country. People attended because it was the right thing to do. But a lot of the church experience was based around things we don't do. Don't cuss, you don't drink, you don't do drugs, you don't smoke, you know, you don't go to certain kind of movies, don't go to certain parts of town. It set a standard that nobody could achieve. Many people gave up. They didn't even try. But on Sundays, they would act like they were trying. Everybody knew what they were doing, but they went on anyway. But young people today don't want anything to do with such hypocrisy that, you know, following an institution so full of fakery. They want something that's real. So to the question, are millennials more godless than previous generations? I say no. They're just more obvious. I mean, were people faking it years ago closer to God than people today that just say, I'm not going to go at all? They want the real thing. So what is the real thing? What does it really mean to be a Christian? Remember the uh, test we used to take in uh, high school? You take a piece of litmus paper in chemistry class, you dip it in a solution, and if it was pinkish, if it was uh, acid-based, uh, it would turn pinkish red, and if it was alkaline-based, it would turn blue. Remember that? Wouldn't it be nice if there was some test where you could take a person, dip them, and determine if they're a true Christian or not? There was a uh, study, or not a study, it was a court case years ago involving a Methodist named William Small. And he died leaving an enormous estate. And in his estate, he, uh, 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 in his will, he said that all the proceeds from my estate are to go to benefit Christians. Well, his kids, his relatives, they sued. They said there's no way you can say who a Christian is. And Judge Shannon B. Charlton pondered the case, presided over the case for six weeks, and finally he sided with the relatives. He said, you can't define who a Christian is. Well, it turns out that the judge was wrong. There's a book in the Bible that tells us exactly what it means to be a Christian. What is the real thing? It's the book of 1 John. It's written by one of the disciples of Jesus, John. He also wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and he wrote Revelation. So turn to 1 John. It's way at the end of the Bible, right before Revelation. John wrote this book to Christians in churches in the Roman province of Asia to combat false teaching by a man named Serinthus. Serinthus taught that Jesus was a mere man, not God, and that Christians don't need to obey God 
and they don't need to love people. So people were confused as to what does it mean to be a Christian. So John writes this book and suggests three tests how we can know who real Christians are. A doctrinal test, a moral test, and a social test. Belief, obedience, and love. Now I love John's simplicity. Dave Ramsey in his uh, bestseller, uh, Total Money Makeover, says, in our culture, we worship the complicated and sophisticated. He said, in the world of finance, we have become arrogant snobs. People think that simple ideas are not profound, and therefore little people. But Ramsey is a multi-multi-millionaire, and he's counseled thousands of millionaires, and he says it's amazing how wealthy people embrace remarkably simple investment plans and financial management plans. Well, that's what John does in his book. He simplifies the Christian faith down to the real thing. He says it's just three things. So what's the real thing in following Christ? I just have three points to make today. Britney Spears was married for only 55 hours to Jason Alexander. After divorcing him after their two-day New Year's Eve fling in Las Vegas in 2004. So I only have three things to say to you. So like Brittany said to Jason, I won't keep you long. <clears throat> the first is the doctrinal test. Believe Jesus. Uh, John begins his letter, that which was from the beginning. John says Jesus Christ was there in the beginning when creation began. He was there uh, creating. It's the same thing John tells us in the prologue to his gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. Uh, John takes the Greek word logos, which he is, is translated word. And that's his name for Jesus. Uh, Greek philosophers use the word logos to describe the cosmic order behind the material world. Now you might wonder why John wouldn't just stay away from a compromised Greek word and just say Jesus is the Son of God. But by taking their term, uh, he was tapping into their own aspirations and uh, telling him that their intuitions about the material universe are right, that it's not random, it's not self-directed, but there is a cosmic principle behind it. You're right about that. And he was telling them that the real logos, creator, designer behind the material universe is Jesus Christ. He made the moon. He made the stars. He made everything we see, the immense universe. Uh, John begins the letter almost the same way uh, Genesis begins. In the beginning, God. John says when you believe in Jesus Christ, it's like coming back home. It's like coming back to your true origin. You meet your creator. You discover who you really are. What's the real thing about being a Christian? You discover who you really are and meet your creator. The false teachers John is combating were teaching that Jesus was merely a man. John says that's not good enough. Jesus was fully man, that's true, but he was also God. That which was, verse 1, was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched. He says we know Jesus was from the beginning. He is God. He's the creator. But we also know he was human. We saw him. We heard him. We touched him. Therefore, God could not, uh, the, the, the Greeks taught, Serinthus and, and fellow Greeks taught that uh, the body is evil. Therefore, God could not be encased in an evil human body. Therefore, Jesus was merely a man. Or they said if you insist that he's God, then he was a phantom. And John says, no, he was real. We saw him, we heard him, we touched him. John says it's not enough to proclaim that Jesus was a mere man. He is also God. He is fully man, but he's also fully God. 
John writes, who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Whoever denies that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Father has the fa Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, he was a real man, human body, is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. You have to believe that Jesus was fully in the flesh, fully human, but you also have to admit that he was fully God. John goes on, if anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ, in other words, the Son of God, is born of God. Now, some people today want to make Jesus whoever they want him to be. They say, I, I can't believe something as preposterous as the virgin birth. I don't believe Jesus made, did miracles. The church made that up later. And I certainly don't believe Jesus was raised from the dead. But I believe in God. I worship him. John says, you can't do that. He says, no one who denies the Son has the Father. You can't yet deny Jesus, God's final revelation of himself, and still claim to know God. You can't do that. What does it mean to be a Christian? You believe that Jesus is a fully God and fully man. Not only do you find out who you are by meeting your creator, the eternal son of God, but when you become a Christian, you discover new life. John says, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. Jesus gives life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and his, and his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. Jesus gives us life and brings us joy. Why well, I've been believing Jesus? Because when we do, we find life and we find joy. John Paul Sartre, the number one atheist of the 20th century, he would be the equivalent of Richard Dawkins, the number one atheist of the 21st century. In his final book, Reminiscences of My Life, he writes, I only trust those who only trust God. And I don't believe in God. Try to sort that one out. <laughs> Apparently, toward the end of his life, he found something about Christians that he could trust. Later he wrote in that same book, I have often wondered what a love affair I might have had with God. I guess you could say I played my life loser take all. That's a tragic line. But the line before is encouraging. I don't know what happened to Sartre before he died, but he was being drawn to God and where believers are. Somewhere along the line, he found out that Christians could be trusted and that they had real life. There are a lot of things to believe today, and they're not all good. So you have to test them. Christians believe Jesus is fully God and fully man, and that he gives life. The second test for who a Christian is is the moral test. They obey Jesus. Some people think that since Jesus forgives our sins, it really doesn't matter what we do. He'll just forgive them again, and so we don't have to obey Jesus. But John says, if we say that we have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. We know that we love him, have come to know him, if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. John makes clear that true Christians not only believe Jesus, but they obey him. He says, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. This is how we know who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Uh, John does not mean that if you disobey God in some way, that you're not a Christian. The Greek text, text in, in 1 John 1, uh, 3, 6 is in the present tense. No one keeps on sinning. No one continues to sin. John makes it clear that you don't make a practice of sin. 
If you're a true Christian, you do not habitually sin. When you sin, you know it's wrong. You feel guilty about it. Guilt is a good thing. It signals to us that we've gone astray. And you respond to that guilt, that nudge from God, and say, you're right, God, I'm sorry, forgive me. And then you get back on the path to following him. These verses do not teach that we can attain perfection this side of heaven. They mean that the person who knows God will not go on and on in disobeying God. It means that when you're convicted of something, God shows you is wrong, you confess it and get back to following him. Nor do these verses suggest that you're saved by being good, but that when you are not obedient, you tarnish the evidence that you know Christ. Disobedience gives other people the right to conclude that you're not a Christian. With me? In the world of aviation, for years, the sound barrier was considered an unbreakable barrier. Um, many engineers thought that Mach 1 was just a wall of air that could not be broken. And uh, the dozens of pilots who died trying to break the sound barrier just, just buttressed that belief. Like the British, when uh, their prototype, the Swallow, disintegrated at Mach 0.994, they gave up their... Uh, efforts to break the sound barrier. But not Chuck Yeager. The American was not going to give up on the impossible. October 14, 1947, a B-29 bomber took off from a rock field high up in the California desert and connected to the belly was the Bell X-1 uh, plane, experimental plane. At 25,000 feet, that dropped from the fuselage and its rocket engine fired to life, and it went on up to 42,000 feet. At that level, with Jaeger at the controls, uh, when he got close to Mach 1, the plane began to shake violently, like 0.96. At 0.965, uh, the speedometer went haywire. At 0.995, his vision blurred and his stomach turned. And just about when he thought the plane was about to explode, there was a large sonic boom and then an eerie silence. All the shock waves in the front of the plane that had caused so many others to crash now seemed to be at the back of the plane and he was like flying in a sea of glass. He took it on up to one point, Mach 1.07. And then he cut his engines and brought it down and landed. He had broken the sound barrier. Like breaking the sound barrier in the physical realm, we have to break the faith barrier in the spiritual realm. The faith barrier, when you're to break that, you get to a point where you feel like you're losing control and everything's about to fall apart. You have to press in and obey Jesus even when it doesn't all make sense to you. The key to breaking the faith barrier is obeying Jesus. What do people see in your life? For many of us, certainly me, there's a gap between our knowledge and our practice. Uh, that's why I think journaling is so important. We provide these for you to help you maybe know what to read in the Bible. You read along with this, and uh, you can be reading about what I'm going to speak about next week. But it gives you a place to write. And if you just read the Bible and don't write anything, I, you know, I, I question what happens. But if you write, and you have to write out what you're going to do about it, there's a lot greater chance you can put something into practice. Uh, January is a time of new beginnings. I encourage you to start reading the Bible with me this year, 2016. Pick up a journal, read 1 John with me and many other people in our church, people in our community groups, and see if we can grow in obeying Christ this year. All right, there's a final test that reveals who a real Christian is. It's the social test. They love people. The Corinthians were proud and despised other people. John says, anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. 
Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light, and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. He writes, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. This is pretty clear stuff, isn't it? Dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. Pretty straight out, right? I love the way he summarizes it in 420. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. John says it's a joke to claim to know God and love God if you, whom you haven't seen if you hate a brother or sister who's right in front of you. You see every day. In his famous screw tape letter, C.S. Lewis writes, um, screw tape writes to a junior devil named Wormwood who his client has just become a Christian. He's talking about love and he says, do what you will, there's going to be some benevolence as well as some malice in your patient soul. The great thing is to direct the malice to his immediate neighbors whom he meets every day and thrust his benevolence out to the remote circumference to people he does not know. Brilliant, isn't it? Put all your love out to world concerns, people you don't even know, and don't love the people you live with, you work cubicle next to, you go to school with. John says it's not enough to believe the right things about Christ and to seek to obey God. These both must be wrapped and tempered in love for others. Again, failure to love does not mean you're not a Christian, but it gives others the right to draw the conclusion that you're not a Christian. If we do a great job of loving each other in this church, I mean we genuinely care about each other when we gather for worship and when we gather in our community groups, we will have a transformation that will become known around the city. People will come from all over Portland because they long for genuine community and true love. So to sum up, what is the real thing with Christian faith? Read this with me. The real thing in Christian faith is to believe Jesus, obey Jesus, and love people. I think of it as three parts of a pie. Belief, obedience, and love. Failure in one area does not mean you're not a Christian, but it means you surrender the evidence to prove that you are. And you turn people off who are not followers of Christ. Like we saw in that first Google search. This presents a challenge for all of us because I'll bet there's Probably nobody in the room that says they got all three covered perfectly. We're probably stronger in one or two areas and weaker in a third. Maybe you're weak in belief. You've never read the Bible. You know, I harangue every week. God, hey, you ought to read the Bible, try this. But you kind of maybe ignore me. And so you don't really know what you believe. You couldn't explain to anybody why you believe in Jesus. Well, maybe that's the area where you need to grow. But when it comes to love, you come on like horseradish. You're all over helping people who are poor or seeking justice for the disadvantaged. But you're not the real thing. You don't present a real picture of what it means to be a follower of Christ. Or maybe you're good at belief. You do fine with obedience, but you're judgmental. You're harsh with people who don't know the faith and mess up in their lives. Somebody walks in the door here, doesn't fit your picture of what a Christian should look like, and you're judgmental, you're unwelcoming. You too are not the real thing when it comes to Christian faith. You don't give people an accurate read on what it means to follow Christ. Your brusque demeanor and mead spiritedness may turn people away from Christ. I don't know how many people I know who are not Christians or don't attend church because of a bad experience they had. The real thing in Christian faith is to believe Jesus, obey Jesus, and love people. Is that simple enough for you? I like it. I believe Jesus wants to do great things through us this year. 
He wants us to make a difference in this community. He wants us to reach our friends, our family members, neighbors, co-workers, classmates, lead them to Jesus, bring them into the church. But to do that, we need to be growing in all three areas, belief, obedience, and love. Next nine weeks, we're going to consider the real thing in Christian faith is to believe Jesus, obey Jesus, and love people. There's no better time to bring a friend because every week we're going to be looking at the real thing in following Christ. Deal? Deal. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, John simplifying what it means to be a Christian into what is the real thing. Three things, belief, obedience, and love. We can keep track of those. So I want you to respond to God today, just you silently, every head bowed, and um, my guess is you're going to find one of these three areas where you say, oh man, I really need to shape up that area. So would you tell Jesus that if you're convicted? Uh, my guess is that conviction you're feeling is coming from the Holy Spirit. So tell him what you want to do in that area, how you're going to strengthen one of those three areas. Or maybe uh, your weak area is belief. Maybe you have never committed your life to Jesus. You could just do that right now. Say, Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I also believe that you came as a man. I've never really put those two together quite before, and I get it now, and I believe that you rose from the dead. I want you to come into my life. You could do that. Everybody, you pray. I give you about a minute. Lord Jesus, thank you for being our teacher today. Thank you for teaching these truths to John who now teaches them to us. And uh, we pray that we could be the real thing this week in a belief, obedience, and love and be growing in all three. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, once again, would you take out your program, The Real Thing? And inside is a communication card. As I said earlier, we'd like all of you to fill this out, whether you're a guest or a regular.